Hey everyone, I hope you're all doing well today. This time we are going to be talking about the Capcom vs. Data East lawsuit. Street Fighter II was released in the arcades in 1991. It significantly improved on 1987 Street Fighter by adding in a bunch of different things, specifically a wider selection of characters, a better combo system, better controls, and just better everything. Street Fighter II became the best-selling arcade game since the arcade boom of the early 80s. It sold over 6 million units worldwide, and this caused other companies to try to replicate its success. This brings us to Data East's game Fighter's History. Fighter's History was released in the arcades in 1993. The home port followed about a year later. The game used a weak point system, and it tried to stand out from the crowd by doing this. Each character had a weak point represented by an article of clothing, and by repeatedly hitting that weak point, you could stun your opponent. This was similar to Street Fighter's stun on mechanic, but a little bit different because of the weak point system. The stun could only be done once per round. But that's not the only similarity between these two games. But before I get into the facts of this case, let's take a step back and look at an earlier case where Data East sued Epix over copyright infringement over their game Karate Champ. Data East released Karate Champ in 1984. It would go on to be the highest grossing arcade game of 1985, it helped to popularize the one-on-one -on -one fighting game genre, which existed but wasn't as popular as it could have been at this point. It is a twin-stick fighting game where you can perform a series of karate moves, mostly punches and kicks. There are no special moves, and the game is fairly simple. It's a lot of fun for what it is, but it is a very basic fighting game. World Karate Championship, also known as International Karate, was developed in 1985 for the ZX Spectrum. The game would make its way to the U.S., where Epix would publish the game in 1986. And then Data East would sue Epix for copyright infringement because they felt that this game was a carbon copy of Karate Champ. So you might be wondering, what does this case have to do with Fighter's History and Street Fighter 2? Well, in this case, the court found that Epic's game, World Karate Championship, did not infringe on Data East's game, Karate Champ. The reasoning was, you can't copyright standard karate moves, you can't really copyright results from constraints inherent to a sport, which is what karate was. This would mean you can't copyright football, you can't copyright baseball, you can't copyright any sporting event, because that would give you a monopoly on something. So, you can't copyright the genre of a fighting game, and that would play a huge part in the Capcom vs. Data East lawsuit where Data East would use the arguments that Epix had used on them in order to defend themselves from Capcom. So now that we know what Data East was going to use as an argument to defend themselves, let's get back to the two games in question. Because Capcom had so much success with Street Fighter 2, this led to other companies trying to cash in. SNK would release Fatal Fury, Art of Fighting, Samurai Showdown, Midway would release Mortal Kombat, and of course Data East would release uh, Fighter's History. SNK and Midway tried to make their games stand out more, while Data East overtly copied Street Fighter 2. And that's not just me saying that, that's the court documents saying that as well. There were numerous simul similarities between Capcom and Data East game. Here's just kind of a short list of them. They had similar character design, there was similar artwork, 
similar controls, and also it was later revealed that Data East's design documents specifically would refer to Street Fighter II multiple times. The similarities between the two games eventually reached Capcom, who, as I mentioned, would sue Data East for copyright infringement, both in Japan and in the United States. I couldn't find the results of the Japanese lawsuit, so I'll just focus on what happened in the U.S. The lawsuit really depended on a few things, like what parts of Street Fighter II were protected by copyright. Could you copyright a punch or a kick? Could you copyright a specific set of button presses that caused a special move or caused a combo? There were other lawsuits that were similar to this one. I have already mentioned Data East versus Epix, but there was also a lawsuit for Atari versus Philips. And that one was kind of interesting. That, in that case, the court found that Casey Munchkin had infringed on Atari's copyright of Pac-Man at the time. However, it also found that some aspects of video games were standard or common, and couldn't be protected by copyright. This is similar to the ruling in um, Data East versus Epix, but a little bit different as it was less about a competition or a sport. It was more about what parts of a genre could be copywritten. So that one, you can't have a copyright on a maze chase game, but you can have a copyright on the way characters looked. This also meant you couldn't really copyright the way a game was played. So you couldn't copyright a fighting game. You couldn't copyright a maze chase game. You couldn't copyright a platformer or a beat-em-up or a shooter, so on and so forth. Capcom would end up losing this case. While the court did find that Data East had copied some characters and special moves, they didn't significantly copy enough to where it would have violated Capcom's copyright on the game. Also, what they did copy was considered to be generic and unprotected by the courts, so you couldn't really come after them for violating copyright, even though when I look at the two games, I can see a whole bunch of similarities between them especially in character designs where they would just flip the gen the genders on some characters or they would add more hair to someone or give him a chain or something like that. The games are very, very similar, and I'm pretty sure that was done by design so that people would see the two and know what they know what they were getting into. Or yeah, Data East just trying to cash in on a fad. When I went and played Fighter's History for this, uh, I was kind of shocked at how closely the two games were. Like, they they look an awful lot alike. They definitely don't play the same, but they look very similar. Some characters are just swapped genders. Some characters are very blatant, blatant rip-offs of Street Fighter 2. It looks very much like a clone that someone was just trying to get by. It's almost like when you go to, um, or at least when people used to go to like a video store, and they would find like a one of the mockbusters, like an asylum film that was just trying to spoof a more popular movie that was coming out from Hollywood at the time. That was really the vibes I, I was getting when I was playing Fighter's History. It's a fun game, and if you like Street Fighter, you might like this one, but just think that you're getting Diet Street Fighter and nothing really special out of it. It's perfectly fine, but yeah, it's it's very much a cheap clone of Street Fighter 2. Capcom v. Data East expanded on the previous rulings regarding what could and couldn't have a copyright protection in video games. 
and it answered a few questions that I had about why clones of popular games were really allowed. I don't always follow court cases. In fact, I'm not really all that interested in most court cases. But this one kept popping up in several of the books that I've read, so I was kind of interested to find out more. And yeah, it answered a, a few things about how generic uh, generic gameplay elements can't be copywritten. So you can't really copyright the idea of a fighting game or the ideas that go into the mechanics of fighting games or turn-based RPGs or side-scrolling platformers or even roguelikes or roguelites, if you will. This wasn't the end of disputes between companies over video game uh, copyright. In 2012, Tetris Holdings took Zeo Interactive to court over copyright infringement and were able to win. The big difference was that Zeo Interactive had copied so much of Tetris and they had previously tried to obtain a license for Tetris. So... Well, similar, or at least based on the same idea of copyright in video games, these two cases are different in many ways. But they've both had a significant impact on what can and can't have a copyright in video games. I find stories like this to be really fascinating, especially when they're from a time when I was a little kid and... Quite frankly, I had better things to do than to worry about the legal issues between different video game companies, many of which I didn't really know existed, to be perfectly honest, since I was between the ages of 6 and 10 when this happened. I was more interested in you know, getting the good swing at recess or something like that. I find the, the strange parts of video game history to be kind of more interesting than like the more well-known ones. And Capcom vs. Daddy East is one of those stories that I, I was really interested in. Like I mentioned, I was reading a bunch of books, and this case kept on coming up. And I just needed to kind of get it out of my system. So I dove down a rabbit hole, and I started coming across other kind of interesting cases when it came to copyright. So that's going to wrap things up. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments section below, and I hope you all have a great day. Bye.